we've seen so many examples where our clients go like, we went, after going through our, our values mapping exercise, we've now reevaluated where we do our charitable giving or we're giving more. Or actually, I used to shop at this particular store, but now I'm not going to do it. I didn't realize that like plastic was such a problem. And so it, it's not just like the outcome of your portfolio, it starts to become part of your process in life. Welcome to The Regeneration Will Be Funded. I'm your host, Matthew Monahan, and in this series, we're having conversations about regenerative finance, technology, and our living planet. How can we build an economy that's in service to life? Brought to you by Ma Earth. You can find all of our conversations at maearth.com. Thanks for joining us. Today's discussion is with Johnny Mayer, co-founder of Ethic. Ethic is a really interesting asset manager that aims to make all investing sustainable investing. Johnny brings a fresh perspective to the asset management landscape, especially through a design and cultural lens. I found a lot of roads led back to Ethic at my time during New York Climate Week. They have a lot of energy and next generation finance talent so this is definitely a group to watch, and I hope this discussion helps to give you a sense of the DNA and philosophies behind the company. Let's dive right in with Johnny Mayer. We are here today with Johnny Mayer, co-founder of Ethic. Thanks for doing this, Johnny. Thank you. I'm excited. Uh, thanks for having me. Awesome. So maybe we start from the top. What is Ethic? Uh, so technically, uh, we're a asset manager. Um, so we build uh, portfolios uh, for our clients um, that incorporate sustainability. Mm. Um, but I think what we do is a lot more than that. Um, really, what we're doing is we're helping our clients, which are advisors, um, make sustainability part of their practice. So whilst we do the portfolio construction and trading and all of those things, we're actually helping them a lot more around tools to have conversations with clients, education, regulation. So it's like a full, mm. full suite of uh, offering that we have to do to provide to make sustainability um, uh, nice. more accessible. Yeah, I, I learned about you guys when we were talking to financial advisors connected to our donor advised funds, and we were telling them our investment objectives. And they were saying, you'd be interested in ethic, like they really um, moved the needle in terms of the ethics and the integrity of the investments and the flexibility and customization. So excited to dive in. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, can you maybe take us through a bit of the chronology? When did this journey start? And yeah, um, it's a lot of years in the making. Um, I think, uh, so Ethic was, we started about eight years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and really, uh, the sort of founding piece was like my, one of my co-founders uh, sent uh, me a paper on organic finance, which was basically saying like, what's happening in food is going to happen in finance. Like people mm. want to know like what, what they're eating, where it came from, what's actually in it. And people are going to want to know that about their portfolios. And for me, that was the thing that was like, oh, I can see that. Um, and so then you're like, okay, great. Like, let's, let's, let's have a crack. Let's see what we're, let's like, start pulling the thread and seeing what's there. And mm. um, we started just to investigate like what what funds are out there, who's doing this already, uh, what data providers. And just by like starting to pull those threads, you started to realize, well, actually we're looking at all these ETFs and um, what they said they were doing didn't really look like they were doing that inside the ETF. And then we started looking at data providers and we were looking at um, – uh, how they were doing their methodologies and they're like, oh, that's interesting how they're rolling up different factors. And we just kept on pulling that thread to realize that like actually to do this properly, you have to build it from the ground up. Um, and so it, it's been, yeah, seven or eight years and what you thought would be in some uh, instances very easy, it's always a lot more difficult than you think. Yeah. Mm. 
Yeah, and it, it's like organic finance, social enterprise, impact investing, ESG, now regenerative finance, like we're SRI. Kick, yeah, SRI. Yeah, SRI. Yeah, it's socially responsible investing. Like, how? I mean, and like it does feel like the the tendency towards greenwashing, the tendency towards the incentive structures fundamentally make money, and so you know what's the nice label we can put on the top and how do we still, um, you know, take whatever externalities and shortcuts that capitalism unfortunately is so good at in order to earn the highest return possible. Um, so yeah, like how do we, how do we reconcile these tensions and what are you sensing, um, now after seven, eight years, what's happening in this field? Yeah. So it's really interesting. So there's like, really, they're all just taxonomies. And so it's just different ways of explaining what sustainability is. They're just different factors. Mm -hmm. um, so ESG, environmental social governance, but you could break it down into the UN SDGs. Mm -hmm. You could break it into how we do it is different um, issue areas. Mm -hmm. um, but really it's just giving a different lens into the port into your portfolio so you can actually understand what's going on mm -hmm. and so whether if you're really if you care about climate you want to understand what are all the driving factors and what are the the externalities that these companies are contributing and do you want to either support them do you want to engage with them like and so what we're really doing is just giving a lens in for an investor to be able to make those decisions mm -hmm. um, once we have like once we realize what um, what they care about, we're able to then do a portfolio construction on top of that and give them the re different reporting so they can make decisions. Mm -hmm. I think the first part is just making um, uh, this data available to people to act, to be able to like look into their portfolio. Mm -hmm. For so long, we were just looking at financial reporting. People weren't really engaging with their um, portfolios. And so now we've got this ability to add so much different data in, into the portfolio so you can actually construct something um, that represents you but with anything there's always trade-offs there's you can't have no impact mm -hmm. we're always going to have to um, uh, make these trade-offs it's just what do you feel comfortable with and what's your responsibility as an investor um, that you have to like take responsibility for yeah so what are some examples of the kinds of data that we now have access to or that you're helping to bring visibility to Yes. So I think this is actually one of the most exciting times that I've seen because previously or when we started, there was only a couple of data providers. Um, and so now there's one, there's thousands. Um, but what's more exciting, there's actually a lot of organizations that l are looking at different data um, that aren't your usual sort of data providers, that uh, financial data providers. Um, and so you're seeing like asset-based carbon um, mm -hmm. calculations. You're seeing like um, satellite image, like imagery, like all of this data can start to be brought into the portfolio so you can make better decisions. Mm. There's still a lot, especially on the supply chain that I think we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see a lot of innovation in. Yeah. It's so hard to calculate supply chain data. That's kind of a little bit of the holy grail. Yeah. Um, but it, really smart people are working on it and um, from all different fields. And I think that's what's really exciting. Mm. It's then when that data is available, how do you bring it into the portfolio um, and how do you start to replay that back so someone can make decisions? And so I think like a little bit about our process is we always knew there would be a proliferation of data mm. and it was always going to change. And so how we sort of treat our sustainability uh, data model uh, is more like a little bit like an iOS update. So as we get more data, as like different variables become um, uh, available and like the research is behind it and we can stand behind it, we can sort of update our sustainability model to be actually looking at the latest data um, when it comes available. And then being able to um, replay that back and uh, make it more interesting for someone as they can see like uh, the data come into the portfolio. And so are there ex specific types of measurements that seem to be um, important to people when we think beyond financial metrics? You mentioned carbon. What are some of the other? Yeah. So where I, what we see, um, and maybe it's just because of the nature of like how people have explained portfolios before, mm. but anything that's quantitative, like, 
people get really excited mm -hmm. and then anything that you can sort of turn it into something that you can understand. Mm -hmm. So environmental metrics lend themselves really well to those. Um, but we've seen some really interesting metrics around, uh, especially around gender um, uh, and, and how that is at, at not just the executive level. So like when we started, a diverse company was one board member was, uh, was female. That, that doesn't seem like a, a good proxy for a diverse company. Mm. Um, but now we're able to measure it all the way through in terms of different management levels, um, employees, um, also policies that they have in place mm. around maternity and paternity leave. Um, and so we're able to actually have a much better picture of what it means to, you know, to care about diversity at a, a particular company. Mm -hmm. But really those metrics where they can, it's easy to understand, someone can explain it easy to their client, that seems to resonate a lot. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the, the core implication or thesis here is that where we put our money matters. And, you know, having now been in the space for some time i'm curious like how how you feel about that like cuz cuz you know sometimes i think if we get so much of this anti esg lobbying message um, we can be like, oh, just put it in an S and P index. Yeah. Like, it's not worth the hassle. Is it really any different to go through all of this customization of my portfolio to try to find the companies that are more responsible or more reflective of my values? Like, it's all the same anyway. And as someone on the inside of the machinery, how do you experience this? Yeah. So th there's a number of different levels. So like the things that I get excited about is it's not just the, the, the portfolio is important and the impact that that has is, mm. is really important, right? So if you're engaging with a company, voting through proxy or doing company um, um, the proposals on what they should be doing, um, that's a definitely a way for you to be able to have change. And we, we've, we've seen plenty of examples of those. And mm. even divestment, we've seen like, um, especially when you have like a big sovereign fund or other investors get behind like divestment, you see ch company changes because they're worried about cost of capital. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the portfolio level, you, we, we do know um, that there is some change. Um, but I think what's exciting is at the investor level, because it's not just like the outcome of the portfolio, it's the process that someone goes through. So it's one, understanding your values and learning and being educated about all these different issues and the interconnectivity of those, um, being able to evaluate what your portfolio has done previously mm. and then how that's contributing to whether it's like global warming in the future and understanding that. And what ends up happening is depending on you, where you are in your sustainability journey, but it actually starts to bleed into other um, uh, areas of your life. Mm. And so we've seen so many examples where our clients go like, oh, I, we went, after going through our, our values mapping exercise, we've now reevaluated where we do our charitable giving or we're giving more. Mm. Or actually I used to shop at this particular store, but now I'm not going to do it. I didn't realize that like plastic was such a problem. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's not just like the outcome of your portfolio, it starts to become part of your process in life. And I think is as I think we have more fulfillment when we're responsible for our actions. Mm -hmm. um, what I definitely saw when I like early in my career, when I was working, I don't look like a finance person. I'm actually not a finance person. I just so happened to get into finance. But um, what I saw was, especially when you're working with traders is there's so many different like steps between what they're doing and the impact that they're having and you just lose empathy, mm, you lose, totally. em you know? And so that's what's kind of happening in our world where mm. we've lost empathy for our, like, um, and we have no empathy and we're doing actions that are hurting um, people, the planet, and mm -hmm. and by making this aware, aware, people aware and going through this process, mm. you start to actually like, um, I think, take more responsibility for your impact, yeah. Mm. So you joked you're not a finance person. What what is your background and how are you orienting in this work? Yeah. Um, I feel like I'm a little bit like, you know, in Happy Gilmore where he's like, <laughs> he, he's like, oh, I'm not a golfer, I'm a hockey player. Um, so yeah, my background uh, is engineering. Um, but I, it, like I would, I have like a career path that was, 
it wasn't even a path. It was just like I would find something interesting and just mm. go for it and I'd reach there and then I'd look around and I'd find something interesting. So mm. it was definitely not a straight line. It's kind of been uh, all over the place. But I studied engineering. I moved to London. I grew up in um, sort of a small suburb in Queensland. Um, and so I didn't have much experience about what was out there and what you could do. And then living in a share house, I, I met a guy that worked at a bank and because I had some background in programming and engineering um i was like helping him with some of his spreadsheets and creating mm -hmm. little like visual basic apps and he's like you should get a job in a bank and i was like okay how do i do that anyway so he ended up uh was quite lucky um ended up getting into a graduate program um it was in equity derivatives because i had a math background it was like it sort of clicked for me and then sort of that's how i got in mm -hmm. um but what I ended up doing was um, more building like sort of software and programs within banks. So mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> trading systems, portfolio management systems, uh, and that's kind of how I got in. Um, but soon was like, oh, I've got to get out of here. Um, so many great people work there, but just the culture of banks and the way that you build products is not really, um, not really, uh, I think how you build good products. Right. It's very hierarchical, like someone at the top is like sort of telling you what to do versus like actually understanding the, the mm. problem mm. and getting excited about the problem and, and, and sort of so solutioning it the right way versus how quickly can we do this? And yes, this is what we're going to sell. It's um, not a lot of engagement with customers. It's like, let's build it and then they will come. Mm. And if I don't know if you've used any banking software but it's not it's not good <laughs> yeah 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 no i mean I, and, and part of our inquiry on this interview series is around web3 and i think in the web3 space or crypto space it's um it's easy to uh bash the the financial institutions ux <laughs> and you know i mean it's just terrible you feel <laughs> like i mean some of the experiences that you go through with our our traditional banks so how do you approach um, both that kind of internal cultural aspect of building ethic and then maybe we can also get into the, the user experience side. Yeah, so I mean, it's like v from very early um, on because I had some experience in like banking and then I went mm. over and did more entrepreneurial things. Um, uh, I kind of had this like two experiences of one in a bank, like the salespeople uh, and, uh, the revenue generators and the builders are like uh, mm. are cost centers. Mm. And so, um, and, and then Silicon Valley is almost like the opposite. Okay. Um, and so what we really wanted to do was create a culture where, where everyone, is, um, no matter what you're working on, has a voice and is part of the process of building and is important. Mm. And so we knew that early on. And so um, we, uh, and so we're, what we, what we try to do is, um, uh, bring in all different types of people um, and like for example our first hire was a creative director mm. you know because when you're building software it's extremely hard to explain what you're doing and um, our CTO is one of the most brilliant engineers um, uh, and the work that he does is so great so how do you um, really show the value of that and one of the only ways you can do it is through design and through user experience like you want to you want that to be as flawless as the code is mm. and so it's like thinking about that holistically of what someone's experience is and the other thing is like especially when you're early on it's really really hard to convince someone to invest with you when you've got Zero. Right, right. You know, zero assets under management and especially zero. when you're hairy <laughs> um, do I trust you um, and so you have to be so much better mm. like and and mm. the, the, one of the other big like I guess like this was very popular at the time it was like move fast and break things mm. you can't do that in finance like you mm. can't you're, you're, you have a responsibility because you're managing someone's money like there's a lot of energy that's gone into that yeah. it's like it's attached to their hopes and dreams like it's a very big responsibility to manage money mm. so you have to be so much better and so creating a culture around yeah like we can't you know we can't be making mistakes um we you know in, in terms of this we need to like take our time and do things the right way mm. um uh getting people really excited about the problems it's like for example when we started like sustainability wasn't 
like how you bring that into a, uh, an investment wasn't there was no sort of gui guiding for it um, how you report there was no impact reporting and so how do you get people excited about the problem mm -hmm. and inspire them to like go deeper and do the r different research and you know um, uh, yeah. And really explore that versus being a, like, oh, we have to do this. Mm -hmm. We have to tick it off, and because when you do that, you're only going to do the minimum. Yeah. And so that's something I'm really proud about with the team is like they they're so dedicated and and find everything exciting and make it interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think that's some of like, um, I think the reason why we've been able to have some success is like it's the team. They're just they're really they one love the mission and and they're dedicated to solving interesting mm. problems yeah yeah well I, I definitely recommend anyone listening uh to check out the website ethic.com i mean it certainly doesn't come across as a traditional finance <laughs> company and yeah i mean the, the, the design is beautiful it's got really nice balance of humor but information and you can tell there's been a lot of thought that's been you know put into it um, how do you go about bringing more voices and perspectives into the design process and into the organization building? So, yeah, the first is just identifying like what you don't have in the, in, mm. at the company, you know, what skills don't you have and where do you want to get those from? And then look, thinking about the different industries where people are, where they didn't know they can apply their skills to mm. what you're working on. Um, and so even for example, like um, we try and bring a bit of levity to it's like, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's a little bit soul crushing thinking about this stuff all the time. And I also don't think people want to be like lectured about it. Right. You know, you want to make it interesting, totally. you want to make it fun. And that's what totally. really with the sort of brand, what we've tried to do. And even in our meetings, like anyone that's had a meeting with us, we try and bring a little bit of levity to it um, because it's like really serious and and mm -hmm. uh, and you want people to engage with it. And it, it is really interesting. It's fascinating when you start to pull it. So mm -hmm. definitely thinking about what you don't have in the company and then how do you bring someone in and get them excited? Like some of the, our team, it's the first time they've worked in finance mm -hmm. and so when you bring someone in you have to do a lot of learning and development and understanding of explaining uh, and then also through that process you start to realize like you know especially in finance there's a lot of acronyms and there's a lot of um, mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. it's a little bit exclusive mm -hmm. and I think it's done on purpose it's 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 almost like we'll make it boring so no one comes in or we'll make it like esoteric so yeah. we can charge more fees. Yeah. So what language can you use to make it more, you know, um, make it more inclusive so people can go, oh, actually, I didn't realize it was that easy to actually understand, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Um, and hey, you just launched, sorry to interrupt, the, the, the Ethic TV series to try to create these kind of explainer videos and bring yeah. a little levity to that type of uh, informational delivery as well. Exactly. Yeah. Not just talking about, um, so we do a lot of, uh, advisor centric content around, um, having conversations and how it, you know, uh, everything from our portfolio optimization and how we do multi-factor optimization and all of those things, which are mm. also interesting. Mm. Um, but then how do you engage about the issues and make it a little bit more, um, exciting and funny and things like that. And also for advisors to be able to share that with their clients. Right. Because ultimately that's what you want. And what advisors want is like, it's hard for them to get in front of their clients, mm. you know? And so they want to uh, have engaging content that they can share and get their clients thinking about it. Yeah. I think about my own experience when we uh, interviewed financial advisors for the philanthropic endowment. And, um, you know, we talked to traditional banks, we talked to some boutique firms, we talked to some impact oriented folks. And, it's kind of an overwhelming and mind numbing process. You get all of these, you know, long documents, PDFs, slide decks, and all the fun names are just these kinds of nameless, faceless, like, I don't know the difference. And like, what am I going to do? Go research all of these different. Some sort of dark color and then rock. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That, I mean, that was one takeaway was wow all roads lead back to black rock yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't comment on that a few times i was like you know do you have something like this no but black rock has this mm -hmm. you know, do you have something that matches that no but you could do this fund at black rock <laughs> <laughs> um 
So, yeah, I mean, it does feel like we need fresh approaches. We need out of the box thinking. We need better design and storytelling. And I want to pull in this thread that you talked about, you know, empathy building. And yeah, yeah can you share more about how you think about that? Yeah. So I, I think similar to what I was saying before in terms of if you th think of sustainability as a checkbox, you're mm -hmm. going to design it as a checkbox. But if you think about it as a way for you to uh, engage with your clients, mm -hmm. then you're going to integrate it into your process completely different. And where we've seen our clients that are doing really well with sustainability is they're actually thinking about it holistically and they're using it as a way to actually build more uh, relationships with their clients because they actually can talk about the things that they really, really care about. Mm. Um, and then how you reflect that back into your portfolio or what what the advisor is doing is like very, very powerful. And, it's, and especially as you think about um, not only at, uh, as an individual client, but if you're um, managing the wealth of a family, right. good luck trying to engage like the next generation on a, a bunch of like asset allocation and short term, mm. long term, like the mm -hmm. only thing that they're going to care about is sustainability. Mm. Um, but I think in, in terms of, uh, you know, empathy building and how you do that, it's like uh, uh, where we see like the advisors doing well is like when they really do care, um, um, but they don't have a lot of tools to do that with their clients mm. um, outside of sort of their own, um, you know, soft skills that they have and so building sort of different tools so the advisor's got um, a framework to be able to go through this um, you can start to connect and get closer to mm. you know that client yeah. and is that where this values mapping exercise comes in yeah exactly yeah and um and it's it's the process of going through that and then it's also um some of the other things we do is we do sustainability workshops mm. um not just for end our end clients but for advisors and sometimes that's the first time advisors are thinking about their own values and what they care about interesting um and so you start to have the conversation and you know and then and really like what i see is uh, advisors have a hard job mm. like it's not it used to be just about money management mm. but now it's so much more of like what what are your financial goals you know like what like it, it, you know, it's, it's emotional. Like it's, mm. what are your what, money, managing the money's one. Like, how do I do all of these financial planning and financial goals? Actually, what are all the things outside of that where I want to find purpose? Mm -hmm. Like it, it's a very difficult role because, um, uh, a lot of the time it's m much more emotional than people think. Everyone says like money totally. shouldn't be emotional, but it is. Oh yeah. Uh, and, uh, and a financial advisor is right there on the like front line. And mm. so something is bad going in their life. They're, they're speaking to their financial advisor. Very interesting insight was, um, when COVID hit, one of our clients was telling me, um, uh, the, from a financial perspective, the mo right when COVID hit, the most exposed was her younger clients because they have more aggressive portfolios, mm. but she only received calls from the, her older clients, not because it was affecting them financially, because they were worried about what was going to happen to them because they were, you know, and so that's like a really interesting insight where mm. it's like, not just about the money. It's more about like, oh, if something's going wrong in my life, I'm going to bring that mm. <laughs> to my financial advisor. So creating tools for them to be able to have the conversations, creating frameworks, education around how to have the conversations, because they're just like, they don't want to be caught out. Mm. It's a, like sustainability is an endless amount of like knowledge. Mm. Um, and you don't want to be there and someone asks you a question, you don't have the answer. And that's kind of some, what I see a lot um, is like people don't feel ready to have the conversation because they don't want to get caught out. And that's, I mean, we can all empathize with that. It's like, it's, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's really, really hard. Yeah. So in addition to kind of the greater degree of impact measurement and reporting that's been happening, um, and we talked a bit about the design process and kind of the unique flair that ethics seeks to bring into this space, like it feels like one of the unique value propositions that you're offering is also portfolio construction in a customized manner. Can you yeah. share more about that? Yeah. So when we when we started looking into the funds like you mentioned we started looking into those what we realized is that you may agree with 90 percent of the securities in that fund but there might be 10 percent that you don't agree with mm. um and so what we realize is that we'll have to build portfolios from the ground up 
of um, and being able to select individual um, companies and mm -hmm. securities that you can do. Um, so during that process, what, what we do is um, we obviously have our values mapping exercise, which connects through to our sustainability model. Um, and then that model uh, essentially is a representation of um, uh, uh, is a representation of all like, rules of which companies are doing the worst in that particular issue. Mm -hmm. So for climate change, we're looking at um, a number of different factors, including like scope one, two, and three emissions, mm -hmm. um, carbon intensity, like how effective a company is, uh, policies. Um, you know, uh, do they have any um, uh, policies or procedures around? Have they committed to any? Um, net zero and things like that. So there's a range of different factors, but that then allows like which companies do you want to invest in and not. Um, but it's actually a really hard problem. And what ultimately when we started to um, unpack it is we we realized we had to build actually our uh, whole investment management platform ourselves mm -hmm. because it's not only about the initial portfolio, but as you go on, you may want to change what you care about, you may want to, um, right. you, you know, invest more money. And so you have to be really dynamic about how you uh, do that. And so we've built it, um, what we call AIM, which is our automated investment management platform, many years in the making, um, uh, where we're able to manage like, um, you know, thousands of accounts mm. across all of our clients um, uh, in a very automated way which is basically taking risk out of the system. And so mm. we had to build that all from scratch. Yeah. Got it. So if I'm a client of ethic, whether it's through my financial advisor, some sort of family office, institution, direct, I have a portfolio that you're managing the assets and we've gone through an exercise of mapping my values, matching it to your sustainability model, and yeah. then kind of constructing a dynamic portfolio of the individual stocks and other asset classes as well. Beyond yeah, equities. so we do we do um, fixed income uh, for some of our clients at the moment, and then we do donor advised funds mm. um, as well. And then um, last year we launched our nature business and we're looking into more um, privates uh, as well. We've kind of been doing, we have like a big community and we're, we're always like um, introduced to interesting startups and things like that. And so one of the things we do for our, uh, um, our clients is just, um, and the community is this, if we see interesting companies, we always mm. send that through to a bunch of our advisors. Um, but making that a little bit more accessible potentially through a fund is we're also looking into that mm. um, because really where we where we want to go is we want people to be able to create a, a portfolio um, for the future that they want to live in and that's a range of different solutions and those solutions aren't all available today right and so whether or not some of the solutions we need um, won't return any uh, financial return. Mm. Um, how do you make that accessible to someone? Do you put it through a donor advised fund and making it tax benefited totally. or through charitable giving? Um, so we're looking at holistically that whole portfolio. So mm -hmm. someone um, can create something that they feel really proud of. Yeah. Cause it seems like one of the big issues we have is the silos, right? Yeah. And certainly in the in the philanthropic space where 95% of the capital sits in endowments seeking a return and then 5% of the funds go out in grants. Yeah. And a lot of that return seeking behavior directly <laughs> negates the, the, the value of the grant making. Yeah. And you, you walk into some of these foundations and like their teams are, are separated separate. church and state. Yeah. It's like these guys just go for the returns and these guys do the grant making. And you're like, well, this doesn't really make any sense, you know, and if um, we were working together in greater harmony, maybe the aggregate portfolio performance is break even or negative 2% or plus 1% or whatever, but we can construct better financial vehicles and instruments to actually conserve the Amazon rainforest and, you know, achieve the purposes and the aims of what we're trying to do, whether it's from a natural capital, social and governance and so forth. So, yeah, like how how do we break down more of these silos that and that's just one example obviously yeah. of a dynamic that persists in finance. Yeah, so I've seen that as well and it's it's almost like psychotic that you would have like totally. uh, the whole impact of what you're trying to do uh, being undermined by someone that has a complete different objective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's kind of interesting it's it's kind of interesting that they're set up that way. 
I think whatever your objective is, you're always going to optimize for that. Um, and so I think, um, you know, as we start to um, bring to light, like, uh, these different issues, like you can't be separate and you, how do you combine? I mean, we see, we see this in like, I, I dare say it's probably why we've had such destruction in nature is mm. we think that we're separate from nature. You know, we don't think, and because most people are sitting behind a desk for nine or 10 hours, they're living in a city, they don't have that connection through to nature. Mm -hmm. But whenever we try to separate these two things, there's always like an, an, an issue. Mm -hmm. um, and we think that we're being smart because it's like, oh, it makes it clearer, but it, 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 it doesn't. We need to like be working more integrated together to be able to get to the objective. Mm -hmm. And especially for a foundation, your objective really should be the amount of impact that you're having. Mm -hmm. You know, that should be the metrics that you're measuring. That should be the things that you're doing, whether it's looking at different communities, whether it's looking, you know, I, and you also see this a little bit now. One of the things I'm, I get a little bit worried about in the nature space is like this objective function for carbon, mm -hmm. you know, just thinking about that and not thinking through biodiversity, not thinking about different communities, indigenous mm -hmm. um, rights and things like that. You just, you know, have one metric and you do that. And I think if you scale that, it, mm. it's going to cause more problems than, yeah. Yeah. And you use this word responsibility a couple of times. And one thing I've noticed is like there's, there's a cultural inheritance that, well, I have to be responsible. I, like the money has to grow. Yeah. Like that, that's like your duty. You're, you're, you're somehow like, I have to make my retirement grow. I have to, you know, take my inheritance and make it grow. Or like I have to pass down to the kids. And like, and, and it seems like we're in this moment where the tenants of that assumption are being questioned. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think you're seeing it. I like, well, I've seen it like in the field, mm. you're kind of moving from this model of um, like uh, uh, preservation right. to legacy. Mm. And that's a very different model. Like as a family, what do we want our legacy to be? you know, versus how do we preserve this wealth and like keep it, you know? Right. And I think that where it works well is when you start engaging, like as a family, what do we want our legacy to be? What do we want to do in the world? You know, and that's a much easier conversation to have than what are we, where are we going to invest? You know, uh, how much return are we going to get? What are we doing here? I think it's a completely different conversation. One of, one of the things we sort of, um, as we create the sort of output of that values mapping is a sort of a, a, a mission statement mm. and a family mission statement. And it's, the, it's like, as a family, what are the areas that we care about and how do we want to invest? And it becomes a little bit of a bl blueprint of how you have, um, you know, a, a legacy. Mm. Yeah. And, and part of that too, I guess, is um, there's this tension between the long-term investing approach which again, one of the basic tenets uh, is like, well, we want to invest for the long term, think long term, et cetera, and an ecological crisis that doesn't afford that type of, you know, waiting decades to make a difference. And we see this in the philanthropic space. You know, you have like the Warren Buffett model, make as much money, compound it as much yeah. over a lifetime, and then give it away at the very end versus, well, actually, money isn't the only thing that compounds. Yeah value compounds yeah. and destruction compounds. Yeah. And so, you know, what actions we take today really matters. And so, yeah, like, how are you noticing those tensions? Yeah, I mean, it's a very, I mean, it, there's so many like systemic things that we have built in, like even the retirement and things like that, you know, that, uh, that you're sort of fighting against, mm. you know, like, oh, it's okay to be doing a job that you don't love. And then you make, you know, you make the money and then you'll retire and be happy. But, right. um, more integrating like what we're doing today with like our future, I think is, you know, but there's a lot of these systems and even like our financial planning tools and things like that, they're all mm. built like that. I think as we start to question more about um, you, there's sort of a short term approach and then longer term, like short term approach is how do you get access to capital, like um, the investment capital that is okay, uh, like whether it's getting a tax benefit and then you can get access to that and then mm. deploy it quickly. Um, so how do you be creative in coming up with solutions of finding new investment capital, I think is mm. one approach. And then I think... I mean, this is, 
a long philosophical question that we could probably have hours on is like how do we change our i guess our relationship with um, nature our work um, and uh, find purpose in what we're doing so we're not thinking about like um, this world where like uh, i have to like have all of this money so i can retire versus like how do i actually do good with it now mm -hmm. um, i don't i don't think i have an answer um, <laughs> but it's like it's I, i think there's a lot of systems in place at the moment and i think as more people become aware that that's not healthy mm -hmm. i think you will see more change I'm curious how your your relationship to money has has evolved and changed over this time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's uh it's very it's very interesting. Like I grew up um uh I say like I grew up really wealthy, like both my parents adored me and had so much love in their house. We just didn't have much money, you know, and so I think it was like a really I've had a very interesting kind of living on two sides of the tracks one like mm. kind of growing up mum working uh, um, you know a few different jobs seeing how hard she had to work and then going into finance and then seeing like um, this decadence and disrespect for money it was like as a it was very very hard to sort of um, reconcile mm -hmm. um, you know someone has to work so hard and is grinding and you know just to put food on the table and then people are living this whole different thing and and that's still something like I I, I struggle with a little bit totally. um, but then seeing like people's like the way that you think about money or how people how their interaction with money like one of the craziest things is just there's so much of it out there like you you know you hear you know you we meet a lot of different families and things like that and the wealth is just crazy uh some of the things that are exciting where you see people go no like this is my time to give back and i want to have the most amount of impact with that and i'm dedicated to it and they put really mm. good teams on it mm. and then other people are like i just don't want to engage with it yeah. um But it's definitely uh, it's definitely been an interesting way. I don't try and engage with like money too much. Like I just try mm. and <laughs> do my thing. <laughs> you do enough of it all day. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like it's it's you know it's it's important that you you're responsible with it. You know, mm. um, and and uh, it, just on my side, it's like how can I have more impact in the world? How can I, um, you know. Uh, invest in different projects that I'm interested in mm. um, and support different projects that I think are, um, which is like very cool. Yeah. Mm. And so if you had a million dollars surplus to your needs and someone just like, okay, how would you go about the, the practical process of deploying that to have as much impact given everything that you've learned? So, so I think there's a, di there's a few different or like a mm -hmm. ways to evaluate it. And I think it's like, you have to even break it down by risk. Mm -hmm. um, where I think, that, like if I was going to deploy capital for um, uh, like a million dollars to get the most of it, out of it, I definitely think it needs to go into nature. Um, and I think it, it needs to go into creating a structure uh, where you can scale different funding um, into different bio regions, bio uh, cultures, like, mm. and, and creating a framework um, uh, to get more people interested into investing in biodiversity. Mm. To me, like that's our number one thing that we have to do. Uh, climate's obviously really important, but the, the, the wave behind that, which is much bigger is biodiversity. And so I think, as you mentioned, like we don't have much time um, yeah. you know, it's really, uh, and so like, I would risk it all, <laughs> um, uh, um, I'd risk it all in, into mm. investing into nature. because I think that's most important. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned bioregion, like, it, and we had a conversation yesterday with Caitlin from o open future coalition. And we were remarking that, um, there is no option in, you know, the 401k account to say like my local bioregion or my local community development fund. Um, but we need that type of, yeah. uh, you know, easy access to manage our funds in uh, our local contexts. And so, yeah, like how, how is the piping and the infrastructure looking for that type of expression? Yeah, I, well, I mean, I think that would be the most exciting thing where we can invest in uh, a range of different, you know, even just thinking about what, what is investment, 
you know, like, wh- like where did it come from? Why did, why did it start? And mm. when you invest in someone, what does that mean? You know, not even from a financial perspective, but if you spend time with someone, you, it's because you care, you're, you're putting something into that. And I don't think we think about our financial investments like that. We don't think, uh, okay, I'm giving money, you know, or investing in this company. What, is, what, is, what are you going to do with that? And mm. does that reflect my values? Mm-hmm. And I think especially as we get more local, you know, you obviously have municipal bonds and, and um, uh, where you can invest in sort of local projects, but how do you get sort of hyper-local to invest in? Yep. You know, how cool would it be to go, I'm investing in this basketball court for the local, and then you walk past it and, and see like the kids oh, playing right. on it, or I'm investing in this particular bit of nature because I have a relationship with it, you know, mm-hmm. I care about it. And then when you, you know, I think that sort of investing is definitely where it's going. We're a little ways away from that. Mm. Even on the munici- on the muni side, like it's quite hard to invest into specific projects. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's only usually available to you know uh, a certain set of people. Yeah. Um, but that's definitely where it's going. Um, you know, and we've seen you know you've seen some um, I guess evolutions of this in different supporting different projects like Kickstarter and some mm. of these other companies were mm-hmm. all about like sort of. Um, supporting local people which i think is like has been really cool and seeing Mm -hmm. that from a um, uh, nature's perspective would be yeah super cool anything around crypto or web3 um no i think it's really interesting i think um in in crypto like it's uh i I think the philosophy behind it is really interesting Mm -hmm. um the application of it has been less interesting in terms of like you know a lot of um, uh, a lot of people have been using it as a way, you know, uh, uh, as basically gambling. Yeah. Um, but I think the the core tenets of it, what it is and what it can do is extremely powerful. Mm. Um, and I'm excited to see some of the uh, uh, different applications on that. Uh, I think with any creating new market, you have to experience this where, mm. you know, it everyone think is on board and then it goes down and then you're going to find the real people that will actually create the value out of it yeah it's like any new market yeah, yeah just like early internet days you know? yeah. yeah um so getting back to the nature conversation i mean i guess you know a lot of folks and i think an increasing number would probably you know look at this conversation and have the objection that like it's still too incremental mm-hmm. you know like okay, we can't just you know, fiddle with the tenets of capitalism that we really need an overhaul more structurally in order to survive on this planet and to have a livable habitat. And yeah, what would you say to to that? Um, I I definitely agree that like uh, that the fun some of the fundamentals of uh, capitalism. I mean, even it, even capitalism isn't. Uh, it it doesn't is not reflected in the same way as what, what it is, you know, mm-hmm. like we have, you right. know, it's not a free market, right. You know, when you have things like lobbying and, and, um, and, and, um, uh, especially here with the political system of it being very influenced by corporate America, you don't really even have true capitalism. Right. Um, I definitely agree that it needs to be a huge amount of, um, change, but those things are like, you know, are we going to have a, a revolution? You know, mm-hmm. those are the, those big, uh, big things. I think, um, from my perspective, is uh, I, I don't want to wait for that, and I want to do as much as I can. And sometimes that's incremental, and sometimes you can slowly build up to something much bigger. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's kind of like, you know, my philosophy is like, yeah, we do need to change things mm-hmm. um, in a huge way, but. How can we just keep building and get momentum? And the more people that think about the world uh, and the impact in it um, will eventually get us to make some big change. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I guess the the one concern I have is that so much of what I've seen in the impact investing space and the philanthropic space uh, risks this kind of uh, delusional thinking that oh, you know, the system's wrong, but I'm doing a good job, you know, like yeah. pat myself in the back because I'm green, I'm clean, I'm w- whatever. And um, yeah, how do we ensure that there's like truth telling behind all of this? Yeah. I mean, I think I think you see a, a, 
a, an interesting bunch of characters in the impact space. Mm -hmm. So we actually haven't really like got into a lot of the impact community and things like that. We've tried to make it more mainstream and bring mm -hmm. the conversation to people that actually um, haven't engaged with it before. It can be a little bit of, um, um, uh, uh, you know, like with anything when it's, Everyone has the same philosophy. It's like a little bit of an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. We've sort of tried to break that a little bit and go to more traditional places and bring the conversation outside of that. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think the big thing is it's not about um, making someone feel bad for what <clears throat> what they've done. Mm -hmm. One of the things we learned early on is when you're flagging someone's portfolio, like, you know, they may have been invested for years and years and then you're flagging it for all of these kind of mm. issues. Mm. Um, an advisor's not going to look great if you're flagging mm. it like that. And so how do you position that to be actually a, uh, a powerful conversation for the advisor mm. um, versus like shaming or making them feel like they did something wrong? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a much better, it's like having real conversations, understanding impact and um, and not being like caught in like we're doing the best thing. We, you know, we're, we all have, we have a lot, a lot further to go and we have to gauge with people that may not have our same views. Mm -hmm. um, um, but by doing that, you get access to, you know, to be in relationship with someone and to be able to actually affect change at a much bigger scale. Mm -hmm. Are there other topics or things I didn't ask that you'd like to share? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think uh, that one of the the things that we've we, we spoke about a little bit, but um, I I think ar around this is like, especially in this space, how do you? Everything's design. That's to me like everything's design. Like so, as we think about. Um, portfolios and as we think about projects or, or different areas, like how do you bring in the best designers? Um, <clears throat> I think everyone comes with their own sort of lens of how to solve a problem. And um, there's a lot of people that don't have a seat at the table, especially at the at design. And so how do you bring that intelligence from like outside the margins in so we can bring in the best designers and the most creative people to be solving these problems? Um, I think in particular, like as we think about nature um, and we think about even creating financial products, like how do we bring um, uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge systems into the design of the of those products um, and bring that like uh, really to the head of the design. So you're building something like together versus like, hey, I've built this thing now, just sign off on it. Um, you know, especially the, the greatest designers within nature and the biggest uh, stewards and custodians are, are Indigenous people. Their patterns, they still live with the patterns of nature. They understand it. Languages are still very much um, connected to nature. And, um, and so how do you bring them into the design process? Um, and so I think about different areas around that um, uh, there's, uh, of bringing like different points of view into design. Mm. Well, I'm excited to have a, a golfer in this wacky field of finance. <laughs> yeah. uh, if someone wants to engage with Ethic and start a conversation, how do they go about that? Uh, so you can go to uh, ethic.com and uh, reach out through there. Um, or I'm on LinkedIn, um, Johnny Mayer, M-A-I-R. Um, but I'm really excited. Thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, you're doing such great work. Awesome. Thanks, yeah. Johnny. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, I hope you enjoyed that discussion with Johnny Mayer. You can learn more by going to ethic.com. I know they're working on a nature fund right now, so we'll be keeping an eye on those developments and bringing you more conversations like this one at maearth.com. This series is called The Regeneration Will Be Funded because we need to change our economy to be in harmony with life on this planet. Please like, share, subscribe. Let us know what you think. Join our community Discord. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you on the next one.